Hi everyone, welcome to the Brown History Podcast. My name is Essen and you are listening to episode 17. On today's episode, our guest is Gayatra Bahadur. She is the author of Coolie Woman, The Odyssey of Indenture, an extraordinary book. We talk about dot busters, Guyana, indentured laborers, specifically indentured women. So stick around, it's going to be great. And if you're enjoying the Brown History Podcast and you're enjoying the Instagram page and you want to support, check out the Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash brownhistory. Anything you do, no matter how little, goes a long, long way. So stick around and let's get this started. So as I was saying, it's an ex- Are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. All right. But um, yeah, it was an extraordinary book. It was very haunting and it was so well researched, so well detailed. I I would not, I mean, I knew about indentured labors, but you took it like to the next level where you're really transported into this world of like survival and it's so haunting. It's like, I don't know. I always saw, you know, the, the West Indies as paradise as a place to get away, but now like I can't see it the same way. I see like ghosts and and this haunting history. And I wanted to, I guess, I don't know where to, and and I was nervous. I am nervous because I don't know where to start off. Yeah, no, don't be nervous. <laughs> so yeah. I guess I guess um I was gonna call the the podcast episode Coolie Woman, but your opening section kind of says why it talks about the C word, and I guess I wanted to know if I could do how that I feel about that. Yeah, and how you feel about that. Well, um, obviously, you know, I gave my book the title Coolie Woman, so I have a degree of comfort with that coming out of my own mouth. I do think that it depends on whose mouth it does come out of, right? So just like with the, the N-word, um, I was not approaching this like um, I am giving permission to, <laughs> for this term to be used loosely and widely, um, right? Okay, so here's the thing, right? I grew up mostly in the U.S., in New Jersey, came here when I was six, and um, grew up uh, surrounded by aunts and uncles and cousins, very tight-knit family, um, and they were my experience of Guyana. Um, I mean, I grew up in a very multi-ethnic, very immigrant city, but for the most part, they were not Guyanese or Trinidadian or West Indian. So in that tight world of the family, the word coolie was used, um, you know, among intimates. So playfully, mockingly. um, And so that was my introduction to it. But I do know that for a a lot of other people growing up in Guyana and Trinidad and Jamaica, mm-hmm. perhaps the first time they heard that word, it wasn't in a, a space so intimate um, and and loving, right? And it may have been used as a slur. So I do think that it, it's, a, it's a very personal decision. I know I haven't answered your question as to whether you should call this Kuli woman or not. I, I'm not going to, but it's, it's just a way to get you to kind of explain the context of it. Yeah. So the reason I did decide to go with it is that um, I really did think that the history of the word um, coming from the Portuguese word Kuli, meaning higher, H-I-R-E, and sort of so like embedded in the history of colonialism um, in the subcontinent. Um, so the Portuguese used the word coolie to describe the people who were carrying loads at the docks. And then, of course, in South Asia now, a coolie is someone who carries your bags at the train station. Yeah. So th- this metaphor of baggage um, seemed mm. to me so perfect, so evocative in terms of capturing the baggage that Indo-Caribbean women have across generations held. And this is the baggage of history, of uh, patriarchal expectations, family expectations. Um, And so that that title is operating at a couple of different levels for me, right? Um, And that's why I chose it. I wasn't trying to make a political statement But um, as I think you know, um, there is a history of reclaiming the word and a poetic history of reclaiming the word. 
um, and Kal Torabuli, the poet from Mauritius, uh, he was sort of involved in a coolitude movement, um, seeing the use of the word as parallel to negritude, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, like taking a word that has this awful history and this terrible charge and then flipping it, using it for your own purposes, right? So Kal Torabuli was doing that and in Guyana, in the 70s, there's a poet, a woman poet, uh, Raj Kumari Singh. Never heard of her. Yeah, she, she, she's amazing. She was um, political and um, sort of at the center of a group of artists working in Guyana in the 70s. They call themselves the messenger group. And she actually um, uh, wrote a poem in which she says, I am a coolie, say it loud, say it proud, mm -hmm. right? So she sort of had this as, the, as, the, uh, um, as a creator in this movement, a creator of this movement, she was being polemical in that way. Um, you know, yes, we are coolies and this is the art that we're making. So she was very consciously doing that, right? So right. This, is, this is not new. Um, it's at least two generations old, this reclaiming of the word. Kuli. The story, the book is basically you trying to investigate your great grandmother's journey from India, uh, Bihar specifically, all the way down to Guyana. Mm -hmm. And how did you, what information did you have to start with? And how did you find more information? Because I think you just start off with just stories. Yeah, I just started off with questions that I had. Um, f for my dad about identity, right? Growing up in the United States, hy hyphenated American, brown, Indian looking, but not Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, no, I was asking my father about our connection to India. Um, and he told me that our closest link was Sujaria, who is his grandmother, um, his Aji. And um, I didn't know her. She died in the 1960s. But he said, you know, she was a pregnant woman traveling alone. He knew her, of course, like he helped take care of her as a boy. Um, and so that kind of blew my mind. Um, mm. she, she was a pregnant, pregnant woman traveling alone, right? So she landed in Guyana and she didn't have a husband with her. And growing up in the very sort of like conservative, I talked about that tight-knit family group in Jersey City. It was also um, a family group with a very set idea. I don't know that anyone ever articulated it or stated it outright, but you grew up with a sense of um, mora morality or right action. Right. Yeah. The, here was this image of a woman totally by herself landing up in Guyana in 1903 without a husband and all these questions around who the husband is and where the husband is. And so, of course, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to know more about that. Um, and that's all I started out with. Okay, so that was in 1997 when I had that conversation with my dad. So I, I was in my early 20s at just starting out um, my career as a newspaper reporter. I was working for newspapers at the time. And, um, you know, I took this vacation a couple of years, I think six years later, I took this vacation, decided I wanted to go to Guyana um, and, you know, pitched a story to my bosses about cocaine smuggling. I was working for the Philadelphia Inquirer at the time. And, you know, they said, yeah, go for it. Because amazingly, there was a local woman from Pennsylvania who ended up in jail in Guyana on cocaine smuggling charges. But that's an entirely other story. That's why I was there, right? right? So, holiday and the story assigned, the, assigned to me by my editor. But while I was there, I went to the National Archives in Georgetown. And at the National Archives is a record, um, our records of nearly every immigrant ship that arrived in Guyana. So the book of emigration passes. Okay, so. basically immigrants with numbers and, and, and records and, and... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it would list, you know, the typewritten form, standard form, standard details, 
um, things like last next of kin, cast village Tana, which is the police district, um, and then sometimes there were handwritten notes, um, which lent some some kind of like life and intimacy to these documents, right? So on hers was written pregnant four months. So I found her, I knew from my dad um, what year she had arrived, 1903, and the name of the ship she'd arrived on. Because this is, this is part of our origin stories in the Caribbean, right? So yeah. my grandfather, who I never knew, because he also died in the 60s, he was born on that ship, the Clyde, in 1903. That's crazy, by the way, that he was born on that ship. Yeah, it, it is very kind of, uh, <laughs> but um, so many were, there were yeah. so many births on the ships and a lot of pregnant women traveling alone um, to come back to, I don't mean to sort of veer off, um, to, to come back to your original question of what I knew and when. So I found her emigration pass and that told me more. It told me that she, exactly how pregnant she was when she left. She was four months pregnant. And I know when my granddad was born. So I also know that he was born premature, right? Um, and uh, it also had um, <clears throat> written in that she had a burn mark on her left leg. So that's another detail, right? About this woman I know very little about and um, it raises other questions. So you start kind of imagining and dreaming into into the places where you don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, you know, what that was about. What was, you don't, she... you don't really find out why she uh, left India, but you do kind of explore all the scenarios possible by kind of exploring the journey of other women. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. kind of elaborate on what were the most common scenarios that women would want to leave their communities and, and jump on a boat and go to the other side of the world? Yeah, so many, many who left were widows. Um, and uh, I think upper caste widows as well. Um, and the reason why that might be is that upper caste widows actually had a, a far harder time um, sort of playing any kind of a role in society. Uh, if that makes any sense, actually, this it was the strictures were, yeah. I think you know, for lower caste women, there was less of less of a stigma. If that, I mean, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it was harder for upper caste widows, um, and so they had more motivation to leave. They were more persecuted. They were seen as someone with less dignity. I guess does that make sense? Yes, completely. Right, okay. as as a, as shameful somehow by virtue of the fact that they were no longer connected to a man, right? It, yeah. Um, so, but um, yes, they were widows. They were there were women who had run away, run away from their mm -hmm. husbands. Um, you know, run 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 away from abuse by their husbands, um, and um, they were in some cases sex workers as well, right? So, what I discovered was that my grand, great grandmother's, um, you know, her mystery, the thing that intrigued me about her um, was not so unusual. And actually it, she was pretty representative, right? So two thirds of the women who left India as indentured servants were classified by the British as single women. They weren't actually single, you know, I mean, most of them, um, you know, women did not make it to their 20s unmarried in India, right? So they weren't single. They were, um, they had parted with their husbands for various reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Or they were sex workers um, or they were widows, right? So two thirds of the women who left India were fit, fit this description. So they were like my great grandmother. They were women traveling alone, women without husbands by their sides. Wow. It's insane to think that they would accept pregnant women on board the boat. Like that there was no like baseline. Uh, it was just like, it doesn't matter. I guess because I guess the need for women was really urgent that they needed women. So they allowed that. Yeah. I mean, they were desperate for women at, at some point um, because there was a shortage of women on the plantations and that had led to um, 
a lot of chaos and also violence, right? Um, so at some point uh, they set a quota so that no ship could, could leave Madras or Calcutta unless um, there were 40 women aboard for every 100 men. That was, I mean, the, the quota changed from you know, decade to decade, but that's sort of like where it settled. And in 1903, when my great-grandmother my great -grandmother left, that's where it had settled. 40 women for every 100 men aboard or the ship can't leave. Um, and so there were all of these incentives given to recruiters. They got more money if they signed up a woman, for instance. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, these women... the point was to sort of stabilize family life on the plantation because there had been um, these very brutal murders of indentured women by men who whose advances they rejected, right? Do these women knew what they were getting into? Did they know what was going to happen to them? Or like a little idea maybe? I mean, there was circulation. So there were indentured immigrants, um, a small percentage of them who went back to India after their contracts were up, a quarter in total returned to India. So of course, you know, people who went back would tell stories of what life was like on the plantations. Um, but it's hard to know how widely that circulated. It's also hard to know what degree of choice um, these women or um, indentured immigrants as a whole could really exercise um, if if they were put in that position because of poverty or if they were fleeing um, uh, gender-based violence, you know, what degree of choice do you actually have? Um, and then there were also women who were kidnapped. Again, I talked about how recruiters were given more money for women. Yeah. So, I mean, that also creates an incentive to take some against their will. And there are stories in the archives of of women who were pretty much like locked up and shoved on a boat, mm. right? And um, so, yeah, you're right. I do talk about, about the different things that could have happened to my great grandmother and the different different um, narratives she might've been acting out. Um, but I do sort of think that, that she, the story that comes down to us is that she was on a pilgrimage and that she was taken. That's what my aunt tells me. My aunt who was close to her. Wow. So I do think that that's, that's what happened. I do think that she was a kidnapped victim, right? So because there, there are two kind of storylines, right? There's a story of kidnap and there's the story of escape for the women and, and for indentured people as a whole. Because I think both were true. There was both a degree of escape from the various injustices um, and social barriers in India, right? There was escape from caste, there was escape from patriarchy, but escape to what uh, plantation society where you are a bonded laborer, right? And so for women, this is also maybe intensified because there is a shortage of women. And because that means that um, women suddenly, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you look at it through the lens of supply and demand, um, if there aren't enough women, then perhaps you can exercise some degree of agency, right? Can say like, I want, I want this guy, not that guy, right? right? And that did happen, that did happen. And women often left one partner for another, right? So there is, there is choice there, there is agency there, but again, like within the context of a plantation. Yeah. Within this racial capitalistic model, right? Uh, so choice, but then to what degree? So after these women get on this boat, what was that boat journey like and how long was it, you know, for women? Uh, were they cramped up in, anyways, you can... Elaborate. I uh, for for the West Indies, it was a three month journey, and it also depended on the kind of ship that you were on. But most of the journeys lasted three months. I mean, if you were going elsewhere, there were other uh, places where Indians were indentured in the world: Fiji, Mauritius, South Africa. Um, but for the Caribbean, it was a long journey. It took three months. So. Um, 
the indentured were in quarters down below. So mm -hmm. in the hold, in the cargo hold sort of, which is where um, uh, slaves also would have been during that journey. And some of the early indenture ships were refitted slave ships. Um, so um, I think, you know, the cargo hold is an interesting kind of space if we're thinking also about brown and black bodies and brown and black afterlives and how our histories are connected and how they're different. Yes. Right? Because, because we also, my ancestors were also in the bellies of those ships. But not in, of course, not in the same way that the enslaved were. Right. Right. But there was also, I think, for both for both of them, the both groups of people, this journey has. Um, it's not only about the material conditions, right, that they were under in a cramped space um, with certain rations, etc. It's not only about the material conditions. It's the journeys take on this kind of outsized, imaginative, um, almost like mythic value. So for the hi histories of enslavement, it's the Middle Passage. Um, for Kulis, <laughs> it's a Kalapani. Yes. Right? So cross the crossing of the d dark waters, the black waters, takes on this like huge mythic value. So it's about destruction and creation and recreation. Um, so the passage that I wanted to read to you actually is about that. I like reading that because, um, because it shows the complexity of that journey and that transformation that there, there were births. My granddad was born on a ship. Many were born on those ships and many died on those ships. And, um, you know, in the archives, I found in each ship report, a tally of the dead, a tally of those who were born. But, um, on this like higher level, there was birth and death and rebirth. Like we as Indo-Caribbeans were becoming a people through that journey. Um, you know, uh, it's an origin story for us. So that although that emigration pass mm -hmm. points to a village, a Burahapur in, in Chapra, in Bihar, that is for my great grandmother, that's where she was from. I have come to see not that as, that's not my point of origin. That's not where my roots are. My roots are on, on the ship. My roots are on the seas during this journey. So I begin where we leave India. My beginning is at the point of rupture. So it's a different kind of origin story. You're not looking back to the homeland, but no. looking back to the break from the homeland. And I mean, uh, so th this isn't new. This is part of the, the poetics of the Indo-Caribbean. I mean, I'm not the first person to think about it this way or to talk about it this way. Um, so the Canadian poet, Arnold Itwaru, um, describes it, the boat journey as Shiva's unending dance. So, you know, Shiva, Shiva's dancing in the circle of fire and as he dances, he creates and he destroys. So, um, you know, Indo-Caribbean, Indo-Caribbean poets and writers have long seen the Kalapani as the space of creation and destruction and rebirth. That's amazing. That's insane. That's very, I don't know, blew my mind there. It's ironic because people in India see Kalapani as something completely different. They see it as a kind of an end, a means to an end, the kind of end of your reputation, end of your dignity, end of your, in a, in a religious context, end of, you know, everything. But here you see it as kind of a rebirth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what we have to do if we're told that, you know, you're null here, you're null and void, right? It's it's our turn to speak back and say, you know, no, <laughs> that's wow. not the way I see it. I see it as, a, oh, ca cast is starting to no longer matter because, because, you know, we're all in this same space eating together and... Um, and there, there, there's intimacy happening in the cargo hold too, and that's happening totally not according to the strictures of caste either, right? So mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that, that system is breaking down on the journey and continues to break down on the plantation. Again, we come back to the, the question, is it escape or kidnap? You know, wow. is it liberation or 
it, it is. I mean, if we choose to see it so and make it so. Yeah. Liberation from caste, right? I mean, that right. is a, that's an incredible freedom and potential. Survival becomes the new religion. That's a, that's a great way of putting it, actually. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> how's, how's life on, on, in Guyana now? You know, your great grandmother's there now. And it's a whole new society with a whole new set of rules. There's two communities there, right? There's one community that was already there. And now you have this new community coming in. And I know, you know, based on British's uh, divide and conquer mentality, uh, the communities are kept kind of separate from each other. And I guess they don't like each other either much. And you have this white kind of powerful administration who are watching the two at the same time yeah of course you know the british were up to um <laughs> the standard divide and rule strategies um and indentured laborers were brought to the caribbean in the wake of abolition right so um the enslaved you know leave the plantation and they start to set up villages in guyana um, and, you know, they might want to lend their labor on their own terms to the plantation, but the fact that um, the British have imported this group of contract laborers for nothing, basically, for next to nothing wages, takes away that bargaining power that um, the newly emancipated would have had, right? So if they wanted to say, like, have a a plot of pro provision ground where they would grow, um, you know, edo, mangoes, coconut, whatever, and then sometimes work on the plantation at their own, um, you know, at a, a wage they could negotiate. They can no longer do that because this scab labor has been brought in across the seas. So those are the seeds of the major initial tension. Though I should say also that on the journey, um, there was a sexual exploitation of the women um, by the ship's crew. Yes. And right, so, so the crew aboard included um, white men and also black West Indians, right? So there was also that first point of contact as well. And there were black seamen as well as white seamen oh. and white, white um, you know, captains, immigration agents, they were all taking advantage of their positions of power, right? So that was also another, um, another reason for tension between the two groups, right? Um, so, and both of those things are part of the process or part of the machinery of colonial, colonialism, right? But, so there is that narrative and there is that fact. Um, but I think that, you know, in my work, I'm always looking for, for the, the spaces to disrupt those narratives. And um, you don't actually have to look far to find them. So, for instance, I was able to find in the archives some stories of, um, you know, black women in relationships with Indian men on the plantations. And there was one in particular that I found out about because there was a pretty gruesome murder connected to it. Um, but so in our, in our individual lives, there have always been ways to resist um, the, the divide and rule strategies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my, the project that I'm working on now um, is partly about America, Guyana and America in the 20th century and in the 21st century. But um, the tensions between blacks and Indians in Guyana is if it's made by the British <laughs> through divide and rule strategies, it's completely like lit on fire by the Americans during the Cold War um, in the 20th century because of the ways that um, the United States intervened in Guyana's politics. Right. Right. There was a coup in the 60s, I think. Yeah. And in the imperial coup d'etat in, in 53, actually, and there were a few. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, 
basically, so among the independence leaders who emerged was a, an, a leader named Chetty Jagan, who is a Marxist. And he is the son of um, plantation workers who were born, who were, came on the ship when they were like two, two or three years old. So basically the grandson of plantation workers. Um, and he's a Marxist. And um, then the, the other primary leader to emerge is African Guyanese, Forbes Burnham, um, a lawyer. Um, one is London educated, one is um, American educated. Um, and um, at some point, you know, the Kennedy administration decides that it's dangerous to have a Marxist in power right there in Cuba's backyard. So they work behind the scenes. There is not an actual coup. So they work behind the scenes through parliamentary procedures and a system called proportional representation to, to push Chetty Jagan, who has been dem democratically elected, out of power. And the way that that was accomplished on the ground with CIA agents and um, the AFL-CIO also, like American union leaders on the ground, sparking like trouble between blacks and Indians and in fact, violence between those two groups. And that era saw like truly intense racial violence, right? So we are sort of in, in trying to assert our individuality, our humanity to get past this history, um, we're dealing with two, two major, major waves here. What happened during colonialism and what happened in the process of decolonization or anti-colonial politics during the Cold War. It's deep. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's but I think you know, like I'm, I'm interested in, in the spaces where people disrupt and resist, right? Yeah. So the work, the work that I've been doing towards that, on which I wanted to talk about a little bit with you because Coolie Woman came out, what, seven years ago now, and I've been busy doing other things since then. Um, the work I've been doing for SADA. Yes. South Asian American Digital Archive. Yeah, they're wonderful, amazing work. Yeah, very cool people. Yeah, so I was lucky to have an archival creators fellowship with them last year. And I did, I collected oral histories. Um, and I also did some poking around in, um, in the census, in the US census in the first decades of the 20th century. And um, so this is a time of um, nativist immigration laws a time of Asian exclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, um, not only are Asians excluded from becoming citizens, anyone ineligible to become a citizen. And in the United States in the 20s and the 30s, um, Indians were ineligible to become citizens. You also couldn't immigrate. So, so the Immigration Act of 1924 bars anyone who can't become a citizen from coming into the United States as an immigrant. Right, so right. it's this intensely um, racist period in U.S. history. Um, but so, in the census records, I find I found evidence of Indo-Caribbeans based on their last names. You know, living side by side with African Americans and Black West Indians in Harlem. Right, and in some cases living with, not only living side by side with, but some, some um, men who were lodgers in households run by African-American women from the South. In some cases, it, it marriages, it seems like, between um, Indo-Caribbean men and African-American women. Um, like, and it, it was just like really exciting to me to find these particular people, their lives tucked into the archives. And here they are again, you know, resisting, resisting that narrative. Um, so I found, you know, one woman, Rose Prasad, she arrives in the 1920s, I forget when exactly. And when she lands, she says her address is, is the Phyllis Wheatley Hotel in Harlem and her sister lives there. So the Phyllis Wheatley Hotel in Harlem was run by Marcus Garvey's Unaya, United Negro Improvement Association. Wow. Right? So, I mean, this is what I'm interested in, the places where we disrupt that narrative. And Chetty Jagan himself, I said he was American educated. He went to Howard in the 30s and then Northwestern. But, you know, he, he says this 
Indian looking student at um, a historically black college. Right, and developing friendships there. Of course, you know, he was developing friendships at Queens College in Georgetown, Guyana with African Guyanese as well. Um, so it's complicated. In, in, in modern day, like right now, have the two communities kind of come together or is there still a lot of tension between the two? So I think there's politics <laughs> or politics as uh, West Indians like to say, <laughs> and then politics, and then they're regular people trying to live their lives. Um, there is this awesome song, actually, I want to find it for you. Um, but you know, el elections polarize people in Guyana um, in a way that Americans are, <laughs> are starting to become familiar with. But um, ever since the 1960s, elections in Guyana have been a time of increased racial tension, right? right? Um, but there is this Guyanese, sorry, let me find it for you. Um, sure. Okay, so Romeo Mystic is the name of um, the reggae star. And in, I believe, was it the 2016 election? Again, like at this time of heightened racial, um, well, not violence, but tension. Right, he releases this song called "Live Life Like We At the Cricket." It's um, a cool name. Okay, so I just sent that to you. Thank you. But, that's, I mean, that's catchy. Yeah, you know, so there is a popular awareness, of course. People not stupid; <laughs> they know that <laughs> politicians are um, cynic cynically uh, making use of our unfortunate history. Right. Um, so I think there are two ways to answer that question, right? I mean, there's a, a growing um, biracial population in Guyana. I think 16% of Guyanese are um, mixed, as we would say. There's a growing mixed race pop population. And we have been each other's neighbors and friends for a very long time. Mm -hmm. There is this popular will to resist what politicians would continue to do to us. Yeah. And the song is a good example of that. I found the reading. Yeah, you want to read it? Um, yeah, and if it doesn't work for you, you can cut it out. No, but, no. Uh, <laughs> all right. So this, this is my favorite reading to do. It's about the origin story, the Kalapani origin story. Um, and so this passage is uh, from the chapter set on the seas. Uh, it's called Hermital Passage. The chapter is called Hermital Passage. Whenever a ship docked, the chief immigration agent at its destination had to report on its passage from India. Some of these dispatches, including the one detailing my great grandmother's voyage, have been destroyed. Those that survive pull back the screen if only for brief moments and partial views on the lives of the women aboard. It is hard in these glimpses to escape the angle of sexual exploitation by figures of all ranks and races. In these archives of misconduct, the women appear resisting advances or giving into them, or in the eyes of many ship officials, courting them. But the records also provide other views of the women on deathbeds, giving birth, losing children, going mad, being driven to suicide, engaged in infanticide, rejecting or being rejected by shipboard husbands, demanding that husbands prove themselves, stowing away, crying, cursing, possibly in love, and clearly in anguish. I cannot imagine that the journey was anything but a saga, even for emigrants whose lives aboard passed relatively without incident. Seasickness afflicted most. A majority fell ill with mumps, measles, dysentery, hookworm, or fever. The ache for home was so sharp that one ship surgeon declared, I know that many die from nostalgia, pure and simple. The excitement of the newness of everything keeps them up for a time, but soon dies away and is followed by depression when they realize what they have done. The realization must have dawned slowly as the sea lengthened 
and the conditions aboard affected them one by one. As blankets rough as jute, sometimes rotten and foul smelling, caused pus to form on children. As the fans for circulating air were shut down at night when most needed, as the condenser to make the water potable broke, which it routinely did, and as the floor beneath them sweated. All the while, surgeons prepared their balance sheets of births and deaths, recording Shiva's unending dance without realizing it. The Hindu god who destroys in order to create, who dances in a ring of flames to maintain the universe's ceaseless cycle of creation and destruction, did not forget the cargo hold. I'm referring to something far more metaphysical than mortality or birth rates. Here, a woman born on a ship to the West Indies in 1888. On that mad ocean when all was tossing, people's heads were spinning, and then labor pains started for Ma to have her child. On that mad ocean, I was born. On that mad ocean, I came to life. She was describing her own origins, but with her incantatory words, she could have been telling the creation story of our people, mine and hers. She could have continued in her voice of myth. In our beginning, there was a boat. On that mad ocean, we came to life. We passed the Red Sea to reach the black. The water was blue before it was green, and then it was mud. We crossed seven seas, seven shades of water, shades of darkness and light, light that died and darkness that was born. Darkness somehow extinguished and light rekindled. The captain's wheel became Shiva's fiery circle, turning and turning in its cosmic spiral. And in the gyrating of the gales and the churning of the waves, as one steered and the other danced, we became new. The moorings of caste had loosened, and people who had left behind uncles, sisters, husbands, and mothers substituted shipmates, their jahajis, for kin. Unraveled, they began ever so slowly to spin the threads of a novel identity. Indenture ships were not slave ships, but there can be no denying a few ties that should have bound the three million Africans trafficked by the British as slaves and the million Indians transported as coolies. The people in the hold in both cases were cut from the same demographic, mainly young and overwhelmingly male. Women were in short supply and subject to sexual exploitation during both crossings, and both journeys were transformative, signaling a break with the past making whatever came before it seem almost as unimaginable to later generations as time and space before the Big Bang. In the beginning, there was a boat. Having emerged from its belly as survivors, the indentured Indians could no longer be who they had been. Like the slaves before them, they were an entirely new people, forged by suffering, created through destruction. In this sense, above all else, Theirs was a middle passage, marked by brutal reinvention. How do I even begin to situate my great-grandmother in this odyssey? If I draw an imaginary line from moment to moment on the ships, from glimpse to glimpse of women aboard, will her shape emerge, constellation-like? Could the wrong shape emerge if I connect the wrong moments to each other? How do I know which are right? Will her constellation give off light? All right, thanks for indulging me. No, that was really that was really poetic. Wow. What happens to her grandmother uh, great grandmother in the end? Um <laughs> well, she dies in 1965, a year before Guyanese independence. That is fortunate. I'm glad that she went before that horrible year in which there was so much violence and tragedy in Guyana. But so her story is, is this, right? So she lands um, in 1903 and is sent to a plantation not far from the capital. And um, when she gets there, she's apparently living with a couple, a man and a woman she'd met on the ship, right? And she has a child for the man. So the story I think is that the wife couldn't have a child, right? So here you have one man living with two women, <laughs> although there's a shortage of women on the plantations, um, he has two. Um, and so there was this law that to transfer an immigrant from one plantation to another, and it was often used when there was domestic trouble, 
<laughs> right. Usually it was um, a case in which there was one woman and two men and, and they were fighting over her. So they, the British colonial officials would transfer the quote unquote enticer, the troublemaker, um, the one who would split up the family to another plantation. So mm. my great grandmother, Sujaria, was transferred in this way from Enmore, a plantation close to the capital, close to Georgetown, all the way out to Burbese, to Rose Hall Plantation. And I was born a mile from Rose Hall Plantation and that's how our family ended up out there in Burbese. Because three years into her stay, she was moved. And um, I think it may have been related to that law and that situation, I'm not quite sure. Okay. And so she takes her child with her, her second ch child, my grand, and my grandfather stays behind at this plantation and more, and is raised by the couple she had met on the ship and wow. lives with them until he's like 14 or 15. Then he goes to join her at Rose Hall Plantation. Um, you asked me what happened to her. So at Rose Hall Plantation, she there's another there's another man. He's um, he was a driver on the plantation. So this is this intermediary figure, who, kind of like a sub overseer. So who would act between the white overseers and the plantation workers, right? So she meets this man, and he is a driver. They have um, sometimes a, some privileges, right? They're a little more powerful. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and um, turns out that she was working as a Kelani. Uh, and these were child minders on the plantations. Child minders? Minders, child minders. So what they would take, take care oh, of like, children. Oh, like a nanny or something, like a yeah, daycare. Exactly, a daycare on the plantation. Okay. It would just be like under. So all, all the, the buildings in Guyana are all raised up on stilts because um, the coast is um, under sea level and there's always a lot of flooding. So it's called the bottom house, right? The area under under the, the actual physical structure. Yeah. Because you know, houses We're, are raised. And there's shade. Bottom. Yeah. So that's oftentimes where the Kelani would mind the children who were not old enough to work on the plantations. And mind you, they started working very young. But so she had this position and he was a driver. So the fact that she had this position means that she also had some kind of privilege okay. because this was often a role set aside for women who were favored for different reasons. And sometimes that's because a white overseer fancied her. So she had this position where she, she wasn't weeding on, on the plantation. She wasn't doing physical labor. Right. Um, so that's, that's what why. I was able to find out about her. And it's unclear why she had that position. If it was because of her, her new partner who was a driver. Um, uh, so it's important to also like probe the complexities of, of, of who people are and who, who history makes of them because she was an indentured servant. She was a woman. Um, and so oppressed in different ways, but she also had certain privileges and status. So they, they become a couple. At some point they move off of Rose Hall Plantation to the village right next to it, Cumberland, which is where I grew up. I spent for six years of my life in that village a mile from Rose Hall Sugar Estate. And, um, and you know, I think perhaps they were given that land by the government in exchange for returning to India. And that is where my father was born. That's where I lived the first six years of my life on this land that Sujaria and her new partner got. And they built, he, my granddad built that house that I grew up in on that land. That's what happened to her. Wow. That's what happened to us. We set up roots in this corner of Guyana for, and we're there for 80 years basically before beginning another, another part of our long migration story and by coming to the United States. What an epic journey. Speaking of which, you went to Jersey City in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That was a really rough time. That was the dot busters, which a lot of people don't know about. Now, I've talked to some people and they describe their childhood as like a vi very, very violent childhood upbringing. Would you, do you want to add to that or do you want to disagree with that or agree with that? 
Oh, I, w- I would not disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, I we moved to we moved to in the neighborhood that was the epicenter for the wow, dot- wow, that's insane. Those guys were our neighbors, like, and so the dotbusters, the book that I'm working on now, which is tentatively called "The Woman from America," and is about Black Brown solidarity, and is about the Jagans and about America and Guyana and what it means to be an American and um, of course, this co- is connected to our immigration stories right? and my immigration story. My immigration story is the story of the Dot Busters. So we, we were in this neighborhood, um, white working class neighborhood. Um, and we, it was, it was mainly Italian American and Irish American before we moved in, in the eighties, the demographics had started to change in major ways. And a lot of Indians and Indian looking people, as well as, um, you know, people from all the Latinos, Latinas from, from parts of, of Latin America were moving in too. So, um, they were basically kids. They were teenagers. They were in their early twenties. Um, and acting out against the newcomers. Um, And what that meant for us, I was 12 when that was happening. Um, You know, someone spray painted Hindus go home on our garage door. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember distinctly being spat at twice. By just when you were walking by someone? So my dad and I were in a, in a car stop, at a stoplight, you know, and someone spat it in his face. And um, another time he'd gone to the corner store to um, buy something, whatever, milk. And he was chased by a couple of boys. And I remembered that they were carrying broken bottles, but dad says, he corrected me recently, he says it was a knife. Mm. You know, and my my friends. So I, I mean, I went to school with with people from all over the world. I mean, we were all like first generation hyphenated Americans from the Ukraine, from Mexico, from Venezuela, Colombia, and lots and lots of Indians. So those boys, my friends, Hitesh Patel, Mifta Khan, they they like had some serious run-ins. I don't know if it was a gender thing, but where they were running from people on their way home from school. It, it was a violent time. So, uh, you know, obviously people know about Navroz Modi who was killed yeah. in Hoboken, about a mile from our house. And they also know about the doctor who was beaten to the point of, I mean, there was so much brain damage, he couldn't remember what had happened to him. And there was a federal civil rights suit that, that grew out of that and failed. It, no, they, those guys were not prosecuted. Um, so people know about those two incidents, but they don't know about what was happening um, on a daily basis on a much more, I don't want to say small scale level, but it was a period of, of really severe hostility yeah. in, in the late 80s against Indians and Indian looking people in Jersey City. And I'm actually, so I'm looking at that, at that lawsuit and using the transcripts from it to try to recreate that moment for my next book project. And an important part of it, and a not well publicized part at all, is that several of the guys who were prosecuted had close ties to the Jersey City Police Department. No way. (laughs) Yeah, right. Who was prosecuted as the ringleader, his father was the acting police chief. Get out. Another one of them had a brother in the Jersey City Police Department. And I kid you not, one of them is currently a Jersey City police officer. No way. So I'm, you know, it's part of what I'm working on right now. So I live in Jersey City now. I mean, I've come come back to it after living. Full circle. Lots of different places all over the world. Many years in London while I was working on Coley Woman. Um, And it's weird being back here because it's so gentrified. Um, I went to school a mile from where I live now, but I mean, and back then it was mainly a black and Puerto Rican neighborhood. And now it's just full on aggressively white in ways that I didn't know or expect. Uh, And it's weird. It's alienating in a different way for me. But so I have to track down these guys because they're still around. Obviously, I'm a journalist and (laughs) not only someone who this history happened to, but someone who's going to write about it as a professional. So that means I have to 
reach out and try to talk to them. Good luck with that. That's going to be <laughs> tough. In a couple of different ways. Yeah. Yeah, there, were, there were politicians involved in this too. I mean, the politicians were, from what I heard, only amplifying the situation and, and exploiting it, right? Well, no? I mean, they're making the right noises officially, you know, but there wasn't any... Um, they were saying the right things, which is, you know, we don't do this. This is not who we are. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there was no, I mean, the police department did not investigate what happened in a serious way. And then arguably the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office didn't either, right? right? And then, and when there was a civil rights case, it failed. Wow. Yeah, so there was no political will, no real political will behind, you know, holding these guys accountable. Right, right. There was a lot of protests from the South Asian community. That's right. Yeah, which I, you know, I was, um, I mean, what it meant for me, my friends were running from, from, um, you know, toughs on the street. But what it meant for me was that I just wasn't allowed out. You were young. I When I was 12, but my parents were scared. They just wouldn't let us out. It was home to school. It was pretty shut in existence. Wow. But yeah, but there were protests, definitely. I mean, I read about them later. I didn't, I wasn't aware of them then because I was a kid and my parents were just not politically engaged. They were doing their thing, uh, working hard, <laughs> um, trying to build a new life, et cetera. Um, but thank you. I know like Corky Lee, who recently passed, he, he, he took photographs um, at some of those um, protests that involved national Asian American organizations, um, ALDEF was involved, um, right? So there was mobilization. And in fact, I think the dot buster, uh, protests against what was happening helped um, the Asian American movement, just like with Vincent Chin, sort of find, it, find its voice in that moment or its mm -hmm. early voice in the late 80s. And thank you. You actually sent me a photograph. Yeah, I did. I did. But that, <laughs> yeah. Of, of some of the organizing and the pro protests. Yeah, I had to contact the, I think it was the library or something, or the newspaper itself. And then they sent me those photos. Which newspaper? Um, I Not would. Journal. No, no, it was another archive thing. And I kind of lied to them. I told them I was like a high school student doing a project and they sent okay. it to me. Well, that I can, photo me was yeah. taken by Corky Lee, who just recently passed. Oh, away. really? No, but what yeah. about the newspaper articles? I sent you newspaper articles too. No, you did. I, I don't remember that. There was an article about how. Do you know how in, in jewelry stores you knock on the door and then they buzz you in? That kind of Indian jewelry stores concept. Mm -hmm. I think there was an article that said that that came that became popular in that area because of the dot busters because everybody was scared, so they put in this kind of system and there's a photo of these two women in saris trying to get into a jewelry store wow i didn't know that yeah i will send that to you this week thank you if i mean if i remember if i recall right um do you want to add anything else you know for the um, audience well i just want to i want to plug my yeah go for it I saw a project actually because I had so much fun doing it, and I think a lot of really interesting stuff emerged from it. Um, so it's called the things we carried, um, and I collected a lot of oral histories. I also um, had an open call for poetry, um, and people uh, submitted their poems, um, and one in particular I'm, I'm pretty excited about um, called Ramu by Moses Bagwan, who is one of our elders. And he was on the ground, um, you know, um, first as a kind of militant for the PPP, but the People's Progressive Party, um, which is known as the Indian Party in Guyana. But then he um, he shifted to the Working People's Alliance, mm -hmm. a third party, multiracial socialist, really sort of people's power party later and they were fighting against the dictatorship in Guyana in the 70s and the 80s. So Moses Bhagwan, people think of him as this political infighter. Um, but when he was locked up by the British in Guyana in 1964, for three months, he was writing poems. 
Um, and he submitted one of them for my my poetry contest. Wow. It was amazing, called Ramu in the voice of a sugarcane cutter. So I just want to plug that. I think, you know, it's really powerful kind of grassroots material documenting our history. And awesome. people can find it at the SADA website, sada.org, S-A-A-D-A.org. S-A-A-D-A, yes. Anything else? No? Yeah. Um, you, you know so what? Much. I was gonna. I was thinking about uh, doing a call to get people to send photos from that dust, dust of time of poet protests. Of anybody took photos, and if I get anything, I'll let you know. That would be awesome. Thank you. I Thank love you that so, idea. Yeah, because it's uh, it needs to be archived. Thank you so much for doing this. This was such an honor. It was such a great episode. This is this is gonna be awesome. I'm very excited that people are gonna hear this. It's really nice to meet you. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.